In Beirut, armed extremists seize a plane to make a political statement. They terrorize the crew and passengers, including two U.S. citizens. As attacks increase against Americans abroad, the FBI and the CIA undertake a daring operation to arrest a hijacker and to send a powerful message to terrorists everywhere. In the 1980s, the United States faced a deadly new enemy abroad, an expanding network of terrorists targeting American interests. Hundreds of innocent people were killed in bombings, executions, and hijackings. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the violence escalated, the U.S. government responded with new laws, laws that gave the FBI broader powers to go after these radical extremists. This is the story of one of the FBI's first cases in the war on terrorism, a war that started long before September 11th. Hi there. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank you. June 11, 1985. 66 passengers, including an American university professor and his son, board Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402 from Beirut, Lebanon, to Amman, Jordan. A gang of heavily armed terrorists overpowers the passengers and crew. They force flight attendants to identify undercover sky marshals to prevent them from intervening. The lead hijacker forces his way into the cockpit and orders the crew to take off. Once in the air, he demands that the captain fly to Tunis. The captain does not speak Arabic. His co-pilot translates. The hijacker wants to force a meeting with the Lebanese ambassador and the chairman of the Arab League, Chadley Kalibi. The goal, to make demands, including the removal of 20,000 Palestinians from Lebanon. As the plane flies toward Tunis, the terrorists beat and torture the sky marshals. They appear to have complete control until the aircraft finally enters Tunisian airspace. Former member of the FBI's International Terrorism Squad, Special Agent Tom Hansen. They were denied landing uh, authority. And in fact, uh, the Tunisian authorities blocked the runways with fuel and water trucks. The main hijacker uh, had conversations over the aircraft radio with the tower. Uh, this went back and forth for an extended period of time, and he was simply unable to break the Tunisian will to allow the aircraft to land. Unable to force a meeting with Arab League chairman Chadley Kalibi, the hijacker reads his statement to the control tower. The aircraft continues to circle the Tunis airport, becoming dangerously low on fuel. The pilot convinces the lead hijacker that to avoid crashing, they must fly to Palermo, Italy to refuel. Flight 402 approaches the Italian airport, but the captain cannot land. The runways there are also blocked. Hey. I've got 
He informs the air traffic control that they must either allow the plane to land or clean up the wreckage. Tell it, tell it clear. Get the, landing gear down. the tower finally complies. Once they are on the ground, the hijackers demand that the plane be refueled. Airport authorities at Palermo refuse. The Italians stall for time with a simple deception. They notified the flight deck that they had, uh, they had notified the Arab League and that they were making all attempts and felt confident that they could get Chadli Khalibi to travel from Tunis to Palermo to meet with the hijackers. The hijacker is suspicious. Why would Chadli Khalibi travel to Palermo when he refused to meet him at Tunis Airport? After an hour of waiting, the hijacker tells the tower that he will throw two children from the plane if airport authorities do not send out a refueling truck. Ten minutes later, Flight 402 is refueled and heading back to Tunis. For the second time in one day, the plane circles above Tunis International Airport. The captain tells the tower that the hijacker wants to read his statement on Tunisian radio, a state-run network. The air traffic controller responds that they cannot patch him through. They don't have the equipment. Listen, he doesn't even speak English, okay? To appease the hijacker, the captain lies to him and tells him the tower has agreed to broadcast his statement. Flight 402 returns to Beirut International Airport. Another terrorist boards the plane. He orders a few children and elderly passengers to leave. He relays a message from a superior, instructing the lead hijacker to fly over Jordan and Syria to read their proclamation. The plane again takes off. But after spending more than 24 hours in the air, the lead hijacker decides to turn back he did not feel that they were getting a bang for their buck, so to speak. So the aircraft never went to Jordan and never went to Syria. The aircraft circles Lebanon for several hours before finally landing in Beirut. Determined to get their message across, the hijackers rigged the nose of the aircraft with plastic explosives. At 9 a.m., the lead hijacker calls the tower. He vows that if 20,000 Palestinian refugees are not expelled from Lebanon by 2 o'clock that afternoon, he will kill the remaining hostages. In Beirut, gunmen rigged the cockpit of a hijacked plane with explosives. Aboard are 66 passengers, including two United States citizens and nine crew members. The hijackers tell the tower that they will kill all the hostages if the government does not expel more than 20,000 Palestinians from Lebanon by 2 p.m. FBI Special Agent Tom Hansen. Without any real notice, the passengers were ordered off the aircraft and instructed to uh, enter into the terminal building. Inexplicably, their 30-hour nightmare is over. The hijackers place hand grenades around the cabin. With the aircraft emptied and in the presence of international media, the hostage takers deliver one more emphatic statement. Hello. Federal law enforcement agencies are determined to catch the hijackers. For the FBI, it is an historic moment. 
for the first time, they can legally pursue terrorists who have attacked Americans overseas, a power they had only recently acquired. In the early 1980s, Lebanon was a country ravaged by civil war. With the central government in shambles, Christian and Muslim militias clash, fighting for control. Beirut, once considered the Paris of the Middle East, is reduced to rubble. The situation further deteriorates, eventually forcing the U.S. Marines to deploy to Lebanon as part of a multinational peacekeeping force. The violence only escalates. In October of 1983, a suicide bomber detonates a truck full of explosives at the Marine barracks at Beirut International Airport. The blast kills 241 U.S. servicemen. Three seconds later, a similar bomb destroys the French Army barracks, killing 58. The bombing at the Marine barracks is the single deadliest attack on Americans overseas. Former FBI Assistant Director of the Criminal Investigation Division, Oliver Buck Revell. The uh, horrendous attack upon the Marine barracks in 83, uh, for a short time, really focused the attention of the American public on terrorism. But it always wandered off very quickly because there was not a belief of there being a sustained level of attack against the United States. Many Americans are unaware that several radical Shiite Muslim groups have declared a low-intensity war on the U.S. Their goal, to drive Westerners out of Lebanon. The most notorious of these groups is Hezbollah, whom U.S. intelligence agencies suspect is behind the Marine barracks bombing. The following year, terrorism continues to plague the region. Diplomacy has failed. Peacekeeping forces have proven ineffective. And the FBI only has the legal authority to monitor international terrorism. Special Agent Tom Hansen. We had no real jurisdiction to operate uh, overseas or to prosecute those who committed acts outside the borders of the continental United States. To give U.S. authorities broader international powers, Congress enacts the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. This new law allows the FBI to apply existing kidnapping and air piracy laws to crimes committed against American citizens overseas. So from that point on, any terrorist group who took an American hostage anywhere in the world, including aircraft hijackings, became the subject of an FBI investigation. The hijacking of the Royal Jordanian flight uh, violated the anti-hostage-taking statute that had been passed in 1984 uh, for the very first time, and it involved the FBI then initiating an investigation, even though the plane had never been in the United States and it was not a U.S. carrier. There were Americans on board, they were held hostage, and therefore the, sta the statute was violated. Tom Hansen becomes the lead agent on the case. The actual uh, investigation regarding the hijacking of Royal Jordanian 402 uh, started off as a, a basic intelligence effort to gather as much information as possible. The FBI knows the two most active terrorist groups in Beirut are Hezbollah and the Amal militia, another Shia faction formed during the Civil War. This here is the plane. They suspect it is the Amal militia who is responsible for the hijacking. They control security at the Beirut airport, giving them access to the plane. Also, the hijackers' anti-Palestinian statements are typical of the group. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell. There was a dichotomy between the Hezbollah and, and the Amal, and that the Amal wanted to remove the Palestinians from the south of Lebanon to um, send them back in, into Israel or elsewhere, uh, whereas Hezbollah uh, was supportive of the Palestinian movement, particularly the PLO. Both groups use extreme measures to get their message across. Three days after the hijacking of Flight 402, four Hezbollah gunmen 
hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens and forced the pilot to fly to Beirut. This was primarily uh, uh, an American flight. There were over 140 passengers on board, many of them American citizens. The Hezbollah made a number of demands uh, uh, in conjunction with this uh, aircraft hijacking, specifically for the release of certain uh, Hezbollah Shia prisoners, as well as certain Palestinian prisoners. Uh, demands which, of course, the United States had no control over, uh, and of course it was against U.S. policy to make concessions to terrorist organizations. The hijackers forced the TWA jet to fly back and forth between Beirut and Algiers. At each stop, they release women and children. In Beirut, the terrorists decide to prove they are serious about their demands. They kill U.S. Navy diver Robert Steedham. They executed him in cold blood, threw him out on the tarmac. Uh, there at Beirut International Airport, which of course enraged all of us and uh, caused us to rededicate ourselves that uh, this wouldn't stand. We would go after these people as long as it took. 39 hostages remain, all Americans. The hijackers move them off the plane and hold them at several locations around Beirut. President Ronald Reagan reacts. Terrorist, be on notice. We will fight back against you in Lebanon and elsewhere. We will fight back against your cowardly attacks on American citizens and property. Authorities consider possible diplomatic strategies. There were continuous meetings in the sit room at the White House. We were trying to come up with some basis to affect the release of the hostages. This was probably the most stressful circumstance during my 12 years in charge of the terrorism program. We were using every intelligence means available to us. Uh, CIA assets, technical means, intelligence from allied services, uh, through diplomatic channels. It was an all-out effort to obtain any and all information about who was holding the hostages, where they were being held, under what circumstances, and of course, uh, any information that would allow us to locate and potentially rescue the hostages. Yeah. As U.S. agencies gather intelligence, 39 American lives hang in the balance. June 1985. Hezbollah gunmen hijacked TWA Flight 847 in Athens and forced the pilot to fly to Lebanon. They hold 39 passengers hostage all over Beirut. The U.S. Department of State applies diplomatic pressure, trying to secure the release of the hostages. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Revell. We were putting uh, pressure on the Syrians, pressure on the existing Lebanese government. We were using uh, surrogates such as Egypt uh, and, and Jordan. So it was really an all-out effort to use any and everyone that might have some ability to try and bring pressure on the, the, uh, the Hezbollah to release the prisoners. Finally, President Hafez al-Assad of Syria offers to negotiate with the captors and convinces them to release all 39 hostages. President Ronald Reagan gives voice to the nation's collective sense of relief. The 39 Americans held hostage for 17 days by terrorists in Lebanon are free, safe, and at this moment, on their way to Frankfurt, Germany. They'll be home again soon. This is a moment of joy for them, for their loved ones, and for our nation. With the hostages safe, U.S. authorities turn their attention to finding the hijackers. <laughs> FBI agents debrief the hostages of TWA Flight 847. Special Agent Tom Hansen. Many of the passengers were shown um, photo spreads of previous uh, suspects in hijackings, kidnappings, to determine whether or not uh, any of these individuals were involved in the TWA uh, incident. Many of the passengers identified the photo that we had of the main hijacker uh, from the Royal Jordanian aircraft. Hansen learns that the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402, a member of the Amal militia, guarded hostages from the TWA hijacking. 
they gave accounts of conversations with this individual who admitted that he was one of the Royal Jordanian hijackers and asked them if they had seen the aircraft and uh, basically bragged about his, his role in that incident. Investigators have identified a prosecutable subject, but gathering information on a Beirut-based terrorist is difficult at best. At the time, a boundary called the Green Line divides Beirut into the Christian East and the Muslim West. Dwayne Dewey Claridge is a former division chief in the Central Intelligence Agency's Directorate of Operations. West Beirut was no man's land for Americans or even for many uh, Lebanese. And therefore, collecting information was extremely difficult, not only for, for, the, for CIA, but also for the friendly Lebanese intelligence services. But the CIA is relentless. Embedded operatives in Beirut continue interviewing informants. Their persistence pays off. They learn where the Royal Jordanian air hijacking suspect lives. The only problem, U.S. authorities are powerless to go after him. It just wasn't possible to coordinate with the Lebanese authorities to hand over, hand over the main subject. There, there was no specific government really in control. Terrorism continues to spread throughout the world. In 1985 alone, there are 812 incidents of international terrorism. 926 people are killed, including 23 Americans. We had so many acts of terrorism committed against U.S. citizens abroad uh, that the president convened a task force, the vice president's task force on combating terrorism, brought in cabinet-level people to examine the law, the policy, and the actions of the United States to best combat terrorism and to define the roles of the various agencies so that it was very clear. And they set up means for interagency coordination. In January 1986, the task force creates the Operation Subgroup, or OSG. I'd like to be meeting somewhere else under different circumstances, but terrorism... This interagency panel is comprised of officials from the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Agency, the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, and the State Department. Buck Ravel represents the FBI. The OSG had two responsibilities. One, to ensure that appropriate intelligence was disseminated at, on a, a full basis. Uh, secondly, to coordinate operations against uh, terrorist targets, whether they be uh, groups or organizations or even uh, terrorist-sponsoring nations. Representing the CIA on the OSG is Dewey Claridge, Even before the creation of the OSG, Claridge had made recommendations for improving the CIA's counterterrorism operations. We had to do something very different because terrorism is a transnational phenomenon. By, what I mean by that is that an operation may be planned by a group in Syria but carried out in Rome. Now, the U.S. government, like all, all governments, is organized on geographic lines, no matter what agency you're talking about. And it inhibits really getting after the terrorists. To handle that, you would create a center where the center would operate across national boundaries or across the divisional boundaries of CIA. The solution, at least for CIA, was to create the counterterrorism center to deal with a transnational problem, both in terms of geography and bureaucratic turf. The CTC unites operatives from each of the agency's divisions, enabling them to pool intelligence. Dewey Claridge is named chief of the center. It was a revolution. Never before had CIA ever organized across geographic boundaries or bureaucratic geographic boundaries on anything. This afternoon, uh, the U.S. is now in a position to take action against the terrorist threat, and the OSG is at the center of the effort. We were looking for 
a target which would do several things for us. One, we wanted to demonstrate to the terrorists in the Middle East that we had the will and the capability of going after them anywhere at any time. Second, we wanted to demonstrate the effectiveness of the new law and to have it tested in the courts. So we were looking for proactive opportunities to, to uh, essentially put on, on notice that the United States was not going to be dormant, it was going to be proactive in addressing these problems. Members of the OSG sift through intelligence on several wanted terrorists, including the hijackers of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402 and TWA Flight 847. The problem is, none of the potential targets are accessible. That's kind of a tough place to get into, but I assure you that For now, all the CIA and the FBI can do is gather information on the wanted terrorists and work to get indictments. Special Agent Tom Hansen. As most investigations go, there, there has to be an element of luck, and ours came in, uh, in June of 1987. The OSG learns that the Drug Enforcement Agency already has a Lebanese informant working out of Cyprus. Because of his associations, they believe he could help them locate wanted terrorists. In debriefing him, a CA operative learns the informant knows the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402. U.S. authorities may finally have the means to capture him. In the 1980s, with the growing threat of violence against Americans abroad, the U.S. government makes international terrorism a top priority. In 1986, the Operation Subgroup, or OSG, learns that a DEA informant knows the lead hijacker of Royal Jordanian Air Flight 402. FBI Special Agent Tom Hansen. Not only did he know the main hijacker, but they had shared a uh, friendship and an association over a period of approximately four years. In fact, indicated that he felt that he could get this person to travel outside of Lebanon and visit him uh, in another country. And this gave us uh, one thing that we hadn't had in the past, and that was accessibility. Former chief of the CIA's counterterrorist center and OSG member, Dewey Claridge. By getting our hands on him and bringing him back to the States and put him on trial, we would be signaling to the terrorists for the first time that we had changed our method of operation and we were on the offensive. The informant is cooperating, but he has a few concerns. I know the Former FBI executive assistant Buck Revell. He wanted a uh, significant uh, reward and relocation of himself and his family uh, to the United States under the Witness Protection Program. Uh, we felt uh, in, in the interagency uh, uh, negotiations that this was a reasonable request. He certainly would be at risk if he and his family stayed in Lebanon. Uh, so um, uh, we obtained authority to do that. In Cyprus, the informant tells a CIA operative that the hijacker has left the Amal militia. The hijacker, in fact, uh, got into the drug business. Uh, he pursued this in Europe and uh, other uh, parts of the uh, Mediterranean so was somewhat actively involved in uh, transportation and sale of narcotics. He told us that the lead hijacker was interested in doing drug deals, that he had been involved in the past in certain drug operations, and he thought that he could be enticed to leave Lebanon, which was an important issue, uh, and go to Cyprus or elsewhere where he would be vulnerable for arrest on our charges. <laughs> The OSG now believes the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker is within reach. With the informant's cooperation, the CIA plants listening devices in his home to record his conversations with the hijacker. The determination was for him to go back and say, I know of a major international drug dealer who is looking to do an operation. Uh, you could bring the drugs in through uh, 
uh, Iran into Lebanon and then uh, set up an operation to supply this drug dealer, and it would be very lucrative. The plan calls for the informant to set up a meeting outside Lebanon between the hijacker and an imaginary drug dealer named Joseph. The OSG decides the meeting will take place on a yacht in international waters. We did not want any operation that we undertook to involve violations of the sovereignty of another nation. The OSG considers whether the U.S. military or the FBI should make the arrest. Here's good news for you. She just handed me a memo. Former commander of the FBI's hostage rescue team, Special Agent David Woody Johnson. The basic plan was that any, any counterterrorism operation occurred outside the United States or its territories would be handled by the military. Anything that occurred inside the United States or its territories, HRT would handle. And so now we got a situation where we, we may want to go over and grab a guy overseas to use the military teams or to use HRT. And now it had to have been debated at the, at the Attorney General Department of Defense level. And they finally described it as an arrest. So we we're going to use the hostage rescue team in spite of the fact that we're going to do it overseas. They choose the HRT because the FBI has arrest powers and the military does not. Members of the HRT are law enforcement officers trained to do hostage rescue and testify in a U.S. court of law. The idea was to try to take him alive and bring him back here and prosecute him. So I think it, you know, the idea was to make a bigger political statement. We wanted to make sure that uh, the terrorist groups and organizations, particularly terrorist sponsoring nations, knew that the United States had both legal authority and the will to carry out whatever operations were necessary. And we knew that it had to be done with interagency cooperation. This operation took a very long time to plan. We didn't want to violate the sovereignty of another nation. We did not want to undertake this and not succeed, that would send exactly the wrong message. Somebody the plan is ready to implement. <laughs> the final hurdle is obtaining the president's approval. As I was going to Washington National Airport to uh, catch a commercial flight uh, uh, under just a pa regular passport uh, to Athens, uh, I received a telephone call uh, in the bureau vehicle uh, from Ed Meese, the attorney general. And he uh, advised me, he said, Buck, uh, I just briefed President Reagan. It's a go. Good luck, and uh, I'll uh, talk to you on the other end. Okay, I don't keep you posted. Before launching the mission, the FBI solidifies their case. We had to recontact the uh, witnesses that we had previously uh, interviewed. And determine whether or not we could get a commitment from them that they would come to the United States and testify. Several passengers and crew of Flight 402 agree to take the stand if necessary. The government now has a prosecutable case. The plan, dubbed Operation Goldenrod, is set into motion. In the mid-1980s, the U.S. Congress acts to give federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies broader powers to battle the growing threat of international terrorism. September 1987, Operation Goldenrod is a go. The FBI, the CIA, and the U.S. Navy deploy assets for the arrest of the Royal Jordanian Air hijacker. The FBI coordinates their portion of the operation from a command center aboard the USS Butte, positioned in international waters 15 miles off the coast of Cyprus. Special Agent Woody Johnson is the commander of the FBI's hostage rescue team. The crew was told that they were just waiting for technical support to come out on the ship to help them correct some problems. We came off carrying gun cases. And, and other things, and we have some pretty big agents, and they don't look like normal technicians, and those don't look like normal 
you know, technical boxes. I remember having one of these young sailors say something the other way by said technicians right. In Greece, HRT member Special Agent Don Glasser rents the yacht where the arrest will take place. What was chosen because it would blend in. It wouldn't, wouldn't attract any attention. We made some changes to it. We actually put a satellite navigation system in and making some adjusts to that and put actually put a Loran on it. And um, it's an electro electronic navigation equipment. In the port town of Limassol, Cyprus, Dewey Claridge and the CIA team set up a command post in a hotel room. We had a communications officer with us and a lot of uh, aluminum trunks of equipment which were passed off as photographic gear. And we had uh, uh, satellite communications back to Washington, to UCOM at Stuttgart, uh, that's the uh, U.S. Uh, mil military command at Stuttgart. Uh, and we, of course we had communications with the Butte, with the, with the yacht, and uh, headquarters was patching uh, our communications through to the FBI headquarters, the White House, and whoever else. Everybody wanted to be in on this, uh, know what was going on. Under sail off the coast of Greece, the FBI arrest team alters the appearance of the yacht to protect the owner's identity. We changed the flag from a Grecian flag to a uh, to Italian flag. We changed the home port and the name on the hull, and we turned the uh, life preservers all around, which had the name of the boat on it. Former FBI Executive Assistant Director Buck Ravel oversees the Bureau's command center on the USS Butte. We had uh, uh, emergency response team. We had a uh, helicopter turning up on the uh, deck, on the aft deck, ready to immediately respond with uh, uh, automatic weapons and uh, other capabilities to defend against any uh, attempt by pirates or terrorist groups to intercede in the operation. Our concerns uh, over the actual execution were uh, that we could get him uh, to the location in international waters to ex execute the arrest, but also that we could secure that arrest and that we could keep it from becoming uh, an international incident. In these type circumstances, you never know exactly what you're going to be faced with. We were dealing with a very fluid situation in Lebanon. We had to have the CIA operations in place uh, in, in Cyprus. We had to have the FBI operations in place on board the yacht, which was the intercept vessel, okay, and our, our command and control and emergency response on board the USS Butte, which was going to have to stay in international waters, but be very close by. And since we couldn't control the exact timetable, it had to be very flexible. The FBI and the CIA are ready. CIA operatives tell the informant to call the hijacker in Beirut and tell him everything is in place. He needs to come to Cyprus now to meet the fictitious drug dealer, Joseph. The hijacker bought into this idea of uh, coming to Cyprus to meet uh, Joseph, who we, uh, you know, who we, um, you know, basically manufactured as a, as a big drug person. Hijacking aircraft isn't, you know, doesn't really make you much money, if any. But, uh, and so he was looking to make some money. The hijacker arrives at the informant's home, where he will stay until the operation begins. We made sure that not only did he throw money around, uh, quite lavishly when he brought uh, the hijacker over to Cyprus. But he had uh, showed him a suitcase uh, uh, full of money uh, that uh, certainly impressed the hijacker. He got the hijacker to uh, state on tape that he indeed was the chief hijacker of the Jordanian aircraft. This is something Justice Department wanted very much. The good news was that uh, the target, the hijacker, was in, on Cyprus, on schedule. But the bad news was that we had learned that the Cypriot police were looking for him because somehow he had gotten on a watch list 
of undesirables. Um, our never is uh, running around Cyprus with a warrant on him. Operatives cannot afford to have local police arrest the hijacker in the middle of the operation. CIA decides to have the informant move himself and the hijacker into the same hotel where they have the command center set up. I felt we could take that risk because it was a weekend. And it was unlikely that the police would energize themselves uh, to run around, particularly to a high-class hotel and a new one at that, searching for this fellow. Sunday morning, the informant tells the hijacker it's time to meet Joseph. He explains that since the drug dealer can't come to Cyprus, they need to meet him aboard his yacht. The informant's brother will take them to him in his boat. We had to have, quote, American eyes, U.S. eyes on the target, on the hijacker, when he boarded the boat to be to be able to tell Washington with absolute certainty that it was the target who was boarding the boat. And so one of our offices was located on the pier. Special Agent Tom Hansen. The uh, boat departed uh, with a cooperating witness and the main subject on time and headed out towards the yacht. We informed everybody on the uh, communications net of that fact and that the operation was underway. Um, we all, that also, uh, we asked for Washington to begin to implement the extraction of his relatives uh, and near relatives, sisters, brothers, and children from various places around the Middle East, which had been part of the deal. Yeah. All right. We had a picket boat system in place to act as guideposts for the, for the uh, cooperating witness to navigate from. FBI's hostage rescue team commander, Special Agent Woody Johnson. My job is to worry about the people that are, that are working for me, and it's a concern if this is a double cross. Have they set us up? Is he, you know, going along with this thing, but they, they're sitting in a boat somewhere waiting on us, and then they're going to come charging in on us in the yacht, and we're going to end up in a, in a fight on the water. For now, all the FBI can do is wait. Undercover FBI agents await the arrival of the Royal Jordanian Air Hijacker in international waters 12 miles off the coast of Cyprus. FBI's hostage rescue team commander, Special Agent Woody Johnson. We pre-positioned the HRT guys on the deck, you know, openly there, with the appearance that we're bodyguards for for the drug dealer. Get that fender ready to go over. Also on deck are two female FBI agents to act as diversions and help put the hijacker at ease. The rest of us were secreted in the down below deck with a sniper in the pilot house in the event somebody shows up that, that we didn't expect. Or that these guys suddenly jump up and have you know, got weapons and start shooting. Uh, we can defend ourselves. Special Agent Don Glasser. Everything looked uh, normal in our boat. The, uh, the female agents were waving to him, beckoning him to come aboard the boat. I keep thinking this, is, this seems to be too easy. Is, is this guy, have they set us up? The undercover agent um, spoke to them in Arab, Arabic, told them that uh, the boss was um, down below in the boat, taking a shower and be up shortly. We said, well, the owner's going to want the uh, want him to be searched for weapons. It would only take a second. We apologize for that, but that was business, and uh, he didn't resist that. So uh, the other uh, other agent patted him down, 
give him a quick pat down for her weapons. Didn't find anything on him. Clean. The other agent escorted him back to the uh, cockpit area where we, uh, he nodded to me, which was the signal that we'd execute the arrest. Major T operators came up from the cabin. He was very surprised. I'm not sure who he thought we were. He was absolutely terrified. Did not resist us. We put leg irons on him and we called the ship. Agents send word of the successful arrest. All right. We're out of here. Uh, at that point, we knew that, you know, we'd done what we were supposed to do, deliver the target to the Bureau, and so we closed down the, uh, the uh, command post very rapidly, checked out of the hotel. As soon as the arrest was made, uh, we launched a, uh, a boat from the Butte. Butte is 900 foot in ship, so we're talking big. Comes up over the horizon and we came up alongside of it. And the captain was, was playing patriotic music over the loudspeaker, you could hear it. Mm -hmm. and he was flying a huge American flag off the back of it. At that point, he's, in, he's telling the crew what's going on. He said, you know, we finally were striking back and you had the opportunity to be a part of it. I'll tell you one of the things that was, it was really a thrill and, and uh, actually kind of choked me up is when we came up on the deck, it, the, Probably two, three hundred of the crew were up on the deck, and they were cheering and clapping. And it just really was a kind of emotional experience. The Butte immediately headed west in the Mediterranean to link up with the aircraft carrier USS Saratoga. Agents interview the hijacker aboard the Butte. The debriefing of, of uh, the terrorists was very helpful to her the U.S. Uh, intelligence community and getting an overall appreciation and understanding of the dynamics of uh, circumstances in, in South Lebanon, the relationship uh, between the Amal and, and the Hezbollah and, and the Lebanese government, uh, and also uh, the involvement of both Syria uh, and Iran in that area. We uh, transported him to the Saratoga uh, aboard military helicopter. FBI agents transfer the hijacker to an S-3 Viking for the long trip to the United States. During its uh, trip uh, back to Washington, D.C., it uh, had to perform two in-air refuelings. Uh, once, the, once the flight was completed, it, it represented the longest uh, flight from, continuous flight from the uh, uh, deck of a U.S. carrier uh, that the military had ever performed. After a 13-hour flight, the S-3 lands at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. The Flight 402 hijacker is immediately taken to Washington, D.C. for arraignment. In 1989, the hijacker is tried, convicted, and sentenced to 30 years in prison for conspiracy, air piracy, and hostage taking. The uh, arrest and prosecution was the the first instance of U.S. law bringing an individual into custody overseas, bringing him to the United States and prosecuting him in federal court for a crime in which neither he nor the victim uh, nor, nor the uh, act or circumstance ever touched U.S. territory. It was our hope that by carrying out such an audacious uh, act that we would send a very strong signal to the terrorists that uh, the, the game had changed that uh, we would no longer uh, be essentially passive, but we'd be proactive in pursuing uh, them across the entire world if necessary. Operation Golden Rock was the first success of its kind in the U.S. government's new war on terrorism. One World Trade Center, New York City. Friday, February 26th, 1993. The basement garage was a scene of utter destruction, cloaked in thickening smoke. A woman, alone, trapped and bleeding, police called operate. police. There were many panicked calls to the NYPD that day, as real life took on the trappings of a disaster movie.
terrorist bombings of what happened in other countries, not here in the United States. And yet, in 1993, it happened in New York City. The World Trade Center bombing rattled our notion of domestic security. It shook the foundation of our belief that we're not vulnerable to terrorism. The cracks it caused in our self-confidence can never be repaired. If it happened once, could it happen again? It was the question in everyone's mind, but no one dared to say it aloud. I'm Jim Kellstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. Somewhere in a crater, five stories deep, in wreckage a block wide, lay the key to the bomber's identity. At least, that's what investigators hoped. At 12.18 p.m. on February 26, 1993, panic and confusion gripped the 110-story World Trade Center Tower 1. People were trapped in elevators. Lights went out. Smoke turned the hallways black. Thousands of the injured and panicked occupants choked as they tried blindly to escape what seemed like a nightmare. The engineer who designed the towers anticipated several potential disasters. He structurally designed them to withstand the violence of a sustained hurricane and something as unimaginable as the impact of a fully fueled jet. Let's go. It seemed that something had been overlooked, but no one knew what. On that day, Tower One became the city's tallest chimney. The stairwells acted as flues, drawing smoke up from the basement, blackening every floor. In the first chaotic hours, all officials knew for sure was that the cause of the problem was in the basement garage. Neil Herman, supervisor of the Joint Terrorist Task Force at the FBI's New York office, was just blocks away from the Trade Center. Unaware of the cause of the mayhem, the FBI took it upon themselves to respond. Uh, initially, we felt uh, and we were told that it was uh, possibly a fire or a transformer. Uh, within a few minutes, it became apparent from the traffic uh, on the uh, police channels that uh, there was something there more than just uh, a fire or some kind of an accident. And uh, I dispatched, along with myself, uh, members of the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force down to uh, the World Trade Center. The immediate concern was getting the trapped victims out of the building. Extensive damage created logistical problems for rescue workers. Many of those inside struggled to make their own way to safety. The elevators had broken down, and those on the top floor had to walk down 110 flights. There were tremendous injuries due to smoke inhalation. As hundreds of emergency personnel continued their rescue efforts, FBI agents dispatched to the Trade Center were scouring the area for any indication of what may have caused the devastation. The destruction was massive. The city streets around the complex were buckling. The Vista Hotel, which rests between the two towers, had sustained tremendous amounts of damage. It was immediately apparent to investigators that whatever occurred below the street level was powerful enough to come up through four levels of the parking garage, up to the street, and higher. Special Agent Chuck Stern of the FBI's counterterrorism branch began the process of organizing the investigation. It started to look like it might be an explosion, a criminal explosion. Uh, I would say maybe within an hour uh, of the blast. And then, of course, more and more information kept coming back. You know, we had um, our special agent bomb technicians from the FBI were down there and, you know, w working with the bomb squad from the city police department and uh, you know they were reaching the same conclusion that you know this is what it uh, this is what it appeared to be by early that evening 200 agents and lab personnel from the explosives unit at FBI headquarters 
were flown in to assist the hundreds of ATF and NYPD bomb squad technicians already at the scene. Locating survivors and getting them out was the only concern. The rescue effort was largely focused in the garage area. As they slowly made their way through the wreckage, rescue workers were shocked and relieved to find survivors. As they moved onward, they reached an area that had sustained massive destruction. FBI, ATF, and NYPD bomb technicians had suited up in protective gear to aid in the search. Some carried thermal imaging cameras to scan for bodies trapped in the rubble. The discoveries became more gruesome. Six people had been found dead. Among the dead was John D. Giovanni, a dental supply salesman who had parked his car in the underground lot. Robert Kirkpatrick, William Mako, Stephen Knapp, and Monica Smith were also killed. They'd worked for a company that provided maintenance to the World Trade Center. Monica was pregnant with her first child. Wilfredo Mercado, an employee last seen unloading a van in the garage, was found dead buried under 12 feet of concrete. Inside the garage was an apocalyptic scene. Debris and concrete were scattered a hundred yards in all directions. Hundreds of cars had been demolished and small fires erupted from spilled gasoline. Pumps drained a flood of water and sewage from broken pipes. Overhead, six tons of concrete clung to warped rebars. Fiber optic cables dangled. To FBI agents, there was no way that the cause of this damage was accidental. Special Agent Chris Rone from the FBI Laboratories Explosives Unit surveyed the damage. Well, as we analyzed the damage to the building, uh, even in the early stages, it was clear that there was a very large bomb, a very large explosive device of some hundreds of pounds. It was clear from the beginning. We didn't know how big it was, placed uh, in the basement on one of the parking garage levels most likely in a vehicle. If the agent's initial conclusions were correct, this was the single greatest act of terrorism on American soil at that time. The morning after the explosion, interagency teams prepared for their first extended glimpse of the destruction. In addition to the ongoing search for victims, they were now looking for any clue that could explain the explosion. but they were explicitly instructed not to move any evidence. The structural integrity at the lower levels was severely weakened. Any disturbance might cause what little support there was remaining to collapse on those inside. The floor of the B2 level of the garage had collapsed, sending hundreds of cars from three parking levels down several stories. All the vehicles came to rest at the bottom level, crushing the tower's refrigeration room. Actually, the engineers told us that that debris that was piled around the columns, uh, sort of like a soda straw stuck into uh, a pile of sand. And uh, you couldn't remove the debris because uh, that would remove what little support uh, was present and it was holding the Vista Hotel up. Construction crews spent hours reinforcing the walls and columns in the parking levels so that agents and investigators could safely explore the scene. After several hours, agents and technicians began to make their way into the blast area. It was very, very eerie uh, because uh, it was deserted and there were uh, you know, a lot of cars uh, with the, uh, the trunks blown open and things like that. And some of them you could hear ticking because the, uh, which was kind of an eerie thing at a bomb site. 
because the turn signals had been activated and were actually still flashing on some of the cars. Gradually, the searches got closer to the origin of the blast, known as Ground Zero. The damage was so extensive that there was no conclusive evidence that pointed to the cause of the explosion. The floors were completely blown away, leaving a five-story crater which extended through the cavity of the building. Investigators searching for explosive residues had difficulty finding them. They were mixed in with concrete debris and building materials. They had to sift through tons of dirt and rubble in the hope of finding some scrap of evidence. Hundreds of damaged vehicles were swabbed and vacuumed in search of residues. Agents persisted. Somewhere in the devastation were answers. As the images of the World Trade Center bombing were broadcast around the nation, people reacted with horror and disbelief. America's innocence had been shattered. The United States joined the list of countries hardened by terrorist attacks. Desperate to catch the bombers, the city placed a bounty on their heads, $200,000, the largest in city history. By Saturday morning, the FBI had set up a command post specifically for this investigation. Every available agent was assigned to the case. They had received hundreds of leads. Most were callers who described suspicious neighbors. Numerous groups had phoned in to claim responsibility. Though most of these leads appeared to be dead ends, they all had to be pursued. Just two days after the blast, as agents chased down leads, investigators processing the crime scene spotted a piece of charred, twisted steel at what was thought to be the center of the explosion. It was part of a vehicle decimated by the blast. Perhaps from the vehicle that delivered the bomb. The number here. Investigators noticed a series of digits stamped onto the metal debris. Though they were explicitly instructed not to remove evidence, they felt their finding was significant enough to override protocol. The metal debris was loaded onto a stretcher and hoisted up to the top of the crater. Once it was on the surface, agents rushed the finding to a forensics laboratory set up by the NYPD crime lab. In the lab, agents and examiners were having difficulty determining what the markings meant. An investigator from the FBI's Joint Autocrime Task Force was called to examine the debris. I think it's 729. His analysis would provide the first major break of the investigation. He called Special Agent Stern immediately. He says, Chuck, I looked at this and I said to the person who was showing it to me, my man, you don't know what you have here. This is a confidential vehicle identification number. Confidential VIN numbers are as unique to a particular automobile as fingerprints are to a person. The hidden number allows law enforcement to determine if a particular vehicle has been stolen. It also gives investigators detailed information about the vehicle, including who owns the car. Within 15 minutes, investigators were able to enter the confidential number into the National Crime Information Center computer, which lists all vehicles that have been reported stolen. A response quickly came back. The number belonged to a Ford Econoline van that had been reported stolen from DIB leasing in Jersey City, New Jersey. The FBI's Newark office was contacted immediately. Within minutes, agents arrived at DIB. The FBI was prepared to uncover everyone or anything that had access to that van. That this 40 Econo line van was, um, in fact, a rider rental van that had been rented by an individual by the name of Mohammed Salome. 
and then later reported stolen. And uh, they learned from the management of DIB leasing that uh, Salome had put down a $400 deposit on the van and that he had been uh, anxiously trying to get the deposit back. After conferring with federal prosecutors late into the evening on Wednesday, the decision was made to have an undercover FBI agent in place at DIB when Salome returned for his deposit the next morning. They spent the remainder of the evening piecing together Salome's history. They learned that Mohammed Salome was a 25-year-old immigrant of Palestinian descent. He had come to the attention of authorities as a vocal supporter of Muslim fundamentalist El Said Nosser, whose scathing opposition to the Israeli, Egyptian, and United States governments was no secret. The undercover agent was posing as a rider representative, stating to Salome that he needed more information about the theft of the van before refunding the deposit. After some discussion, Salome walked out with the $400. As he stepped out of the office, dozens of FBI agents who had been monitoring their discussion descended upon Salome. Less than one week after the bombing, the FBI had a suspect in custody. Salome said little to the agents who questioned him about the bombing. They knew it was probable that he had not acted alone. The investigation was taking on a clearer focus. When Salome was arrested, agents recovered various personal items, including his wallet, which contained several business cards and telephone numbers. They began by searching the address listed on his driver's license. A former roommate told agents that Salome no longer lived at that address. However, they were able to find some belongings of Salome's that he had left behind. There were news clippings and photos relating to Nocer, and a photo of him and Nocer together. There were numerous bank records. There were also more names and numbers for investigators to pursue. We were able to obtain addresses we were able to obtain telephone numbers. We were able to have pen registers where we were able to monitor phone calls, calls coming in and going out. Um, and once that started, again, it opened up the floodgates. Investigators were also receiving help from the public. A few days after Salome's arrest, the manager of the space station storage facility in Jersey City called the FBI. Individuals who rented Unit 4344 had received several deliveries from chemical companies just prior to the Trade Center blast. The manager ordered a key and opened the unit. Inside, he found what he thought to be bomb-making paraphernalia. FBI agents would reach the same conclusion. Inside, investigators found several compounds which could be used for making explosives. Their findings were sent to the FBI lab for analysis. There were also many other leads that emerged from the search of the storage facility. Receipts for the chemicals, bank and phone records, and an unexpected bonus, a log of the suspect's comings and goings. To enter the facility, each tenant was required to punch in their special access code on a keypad located at the entrance. Each time a tenant punched in his number, it was recorded in a computer system. Agents could determine each time Unit 4344 was accessed. Meanwhile, police assembled a lineup. Doug Melvin, manager of the space station, identified Mohammed Salome as the man who rented the locker. He recognized him yeah, easily because Salome frequently visited his storage locker. In Melvin's experience, no, no, know. That, customers usually had no reason to do that. Continuing to search for any possible lead, agents obtained phone records from a payphone just outside the storage facility. 
one name on the list of individuals who received calls from that phone was already familiar to the FBI. That name was Nidal Ayad. Nidal Ayad's name first appeared on a business card found inside Salome's wallet. Ayad worked as a chemical engineer. Within a week of Salome's arrest, agents learned Ayad had called a chemical company inquiring about buying chemicals. The prospect of another bomb was frighteningly real. It appeared that another act of violence was in the making. Agents felt they had sufficient information to obtain a warrant for Ayad's arrest. On March 10th, the FBI raided his home in New Jersey as he and his family ate dinner. After searching his home, agents quickly made their way to his place of business, Allied Chemical. There, they confiscated phone records and bank statements that could tie him to Salome. The most irrefutable link between Ayad and the bomb plot, however, came from Ayad's business computer. It was seized and then thoroughly examined. Our technical people were able to uh, restore an erased file, uh, which turned out to be a, uh, a letter claiming credit for the World Trade Center bombing on behalf of an organization known as the uh, Liberation Army 5th Battalion. A similar letter had been sent to the New York Times four days after the explosion. In it, the group called the bombing an act of terrorism to protest American support for Israel. There was also a second letter Ayad hadn't had time to send. It promised another blast. Though the investigation was progressing very quickly, each new discovery revealed the existence of a large and ongoing conspiracy. The potential for more attacks grew more likely every day. As the FBI tried to learn more from their prime suspects in the World Trade Center bombing, Salome and Ayad continued to stonewall their efforts. Analysis of all the confiscated phone records led investigators to an apartment in Jersey City. The landlord who owned the apartment at 40 Pemrapo Avenue confirmed that Salome and another individual rented the apartment from early January of 1993 until the end of February, just two months later. The landlord could not confirm the identity of Salome's roommate, whose name he knew only as Rashid. Most likely, that name was an alias. A search warrant was quickly issued. After executing the warrant, agents discovered that 40 Pemrapo Avenue was the bomb factory, the place where the conspirators mixed an explosive powerful enough to rock the World Trade Center. Inside the apartment and an adjacent garage, FBI forensic examiners recovered traces of a diverse range of chemicals. These items were collected and then rushed to the FBI laboratory in Washington, DC. While agents searched the apartment, the identity of Salome's mysterious roommate emerged. They found papers requesting political asylum in the name of Ramsey Yosef, who, according to the documents, had been detained in September of 1992 at Kennedy Airport for entering the country without a visa. The Pam Rappo Avenue apartment was a gold mine for the FBI. Before they learned of the apartment, the FBI's laboratory examiners could only speculate from residue samples taken at the Trade Center that the bomb used was comprised of the highly explosive compound urea nitrate. The discovery of the bomb factory at Pam Rappo Avenue, however, made them certain. From the labs at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., Special Agent Rone reported the findings. From the analyses in the laboratory, we, we concluded that it was made with urea nitrate, uh, you know, a homemade explosive mixture. Uh, there's no such commercial product. So they had to mix this themselves. And, and when we 
finally located the storehouse or workshop where they did make the bomb, this was confirmed. These materials or re remnants of them were, were available and confirmed that this is what we were indeed seeing in the laboratory in these residues. Witness interviews and phone record analysis yeah, continued, so we'll directed that. mainly at the locations where key elements of the conspiracy had taken place. All of those interviewed mentioned seeing a distinctive looking individual in the company of Salome and Ramsey Yosef. Phone records helped to identify that individual as Mahmoud Abu Halima. As agents focused their investigation on Abu Halima, they learned that shortly after the bombing, he had fled the country. Abu Halima was well known to authorities through his association with El Sayed Nasser. Abu Halima was also close to the radical Muslim cleric Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, who would later be sentenced to life in prison for a conspiracy to bomb several New York City landmarks. Soon after agents learned that Abu Halima had fled the country, Egyptian authorities contacted the FBI to say that he'd been arrested and detained in Cairo. Abu Halima had been wanted there for conspiring against Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. Negotiations between the United States and Egyptian governments were successful. Agents flew to Egypt and took Abu Halima into FBI custody. When he was turned over to FBI agents, his hands were cuffed and his head was entirely covered. He told the FBI that he thought he was being taken out to be shot. Relieved to now be in their custody, he spoke to agents on the flight back to New York. He did make several statements that you know, were used against him at, at trial. Um, one, of the, one of the key things that he said was, uh, you, know, you know about Rashid, who was later determined to be an alias used by Ramsey Yosef. Abu Halima told Stern that he and Yosef had met in Afghanistan at a secret camp for the Muhadin Muslim Freedom Fighters, a training ground for international terrorists. At every step of the investigation, Ramsey Yosef's name appeared. He was a known international terrorist and an expert with explosives. Agents now believed he was the mastermind behind the World Trade Center bombing. The FBI began searching for Yosef. They soon learned that he fled the country the night of the Trade Center bombing. An international manhunt for Ramsey Yosef had begun. In the meantime, agents were trying to determine how and when Yosef came to the United States. It's been said that the day Ramsey Yosef arrived on American soil was the day terrorism came to America. On September 1st, 1992, the shadowy Afghan-trained master bomb maker arrived at New York's Kennedy Airport. The FBI's close scrutiny of the passenger manifest from Yosef's flight that day revealed another clue. He had not entered the country alone in September of 1992. With him was Ahmad Ajaj, but Ajaj had been detained by customs agents for producing a false Swedish passport. In Ajaj's suitcase, customs agents found a library of manuals on bomb making and guerrilla warfare. The suitcase was confiscated, and Ajaj was arrested and jailed for passport fraud. To the FBI, Ajaj appeared to be an unlikely conspirator. He had been incarcerated from September of 1992 through the bombing of the Trade Center in February of 1993. Fortunately for agents, prison policy required that all phone conversations be recorded. Ajaj had unwittingly left a trail, and agents quickly followed it. And we began to see that he was, through various methods, um, predominantly through three-way calling, where he would call another individual and then that individual would forward the calls. Um, he was staying in contact with um, the other conspirators and was in fact uh, trying to assist them in completing their mission of, of uh, you know, building this bomb. 
Hajjaj was questioned by FBI agents about his contacts and his knowledge of the bombing. He said little. His silence was not enough to prevent FBI agents from arresting and charging him in connection with the bombing. With four conspirators now in custody, authorities decided to bring them to trial while the search for other bombers continued. In September of 1993, six months after the bombing of the World Trade Center, Salome, Ayad, Abu Halima, and Ajaj appeared in federal court in New York City. By the time that the trial started in September of 1993, we really had to have two investigations in one. We had to have an investigation basically continuing to identify those responsible, locate those that were also charged that were fugitives, and also prepare for a six-month trial that ultimately ended in March of 1994. By this time, examiners had processed numerous crime scenes. The World Trade Center. The storage facility. And the bomb factory. 70% of the van that delivered the bomb had been collected. There was also a mass of receipts, phone records, and interviews. Tons of evidence had been recovered. It would now be up to a jury to determine if it was enough. By September of 1993, six months after the bombing, federal prosecutors were ready to present to a jury how the defendants carried out the bombing of the World Trade Center. The conspiracy began soon after Ramzi Yosef arrived in America in September of 1992. He moved in with Salome, and the two became close friends. The friendship was founded on a mutual hatred of Israel and a desire to disrupt U.S. support of the Israeli government. They chose the World Trade Center as the stage for articulating their political agenda. The World Trade Towers are the city's tallest buildings, rising a quarter mile above the pavement. In addition to the two towers, the complex includes the Vista Hotel, numerous underground shopping areas, and entrances to the subway lines that connect New York and New Jersey. Below that are five parking levels, each level containing more offices and businesses. The terrorists decided the bomb could cause the most damage, claim the most lives, by being placed in the garage. The plan was put into effect. Receipts showed that in November, Yosef used an alias to buy chemicals. Throughout the winter, he would order more as he honed the formula for his bomb and worked out the plan of attack. The chemicals were delivered to space station storage. Salome or Yosef would sign for them, using aliases to make sure that no paper trail could lead to them. Yosef was desperate for the bomb-making manuals in Ajaj's confiscated luggage. Yosef developed a clever three-way calling system to hide the trail from Ajaj's prison phone in New York City to his New Jersey apartment. First, Yosef called a burger stand in Dallas, okay, Texas, where his friend Iyad Ishmael worked. Then Ishmael called Ajaj as Yosef waited on the other line. Get them here. No. Look. When Ajaj answered the phone in prison, Everything Ishmael is connected him with Yosef. Ajaj, how are you doing? Together, the three were able to discuss the bomb's construction. The jury was methodically being shown the lengths to which the bombers had gone to protect themselves. These bombers would not be deterred. The prosecutors continued. One winter afternoon, the bombers' plot stalled. Salome and Yosef were driving back from Abu Halima's New Jersey home 
when Salome lost control of his car. He suffered only minor injuries. Yosef was more seriously hurt. He was hospitalized for a week. Yosef made calls to chemical companies from his hospital bed. The FBI learned who he called and when through hospital phone records. As Yosef recuperated, Salome, Ayad, and Abu Halima drove deep into the Pennsylvania woods. Here they tested a prototype of their deadly mixture. It exploded, but it needed more power. So in the coming days, Ayad would attempt to buy compressed hydrogen gas. Hydrogen is so commonly used in Middle Eastern terrorist bombings that it's considered a signature. Even though Ayad worked as a chemical engineer, he had problems finding a company that would sell it to him. On February 16th, the chemist, Ayan, rented a car to scout the World Trade Center. Salome's fingerprints on the wheel revealed that he drove. His prints were also on the parking ticket for the garage's B2 level. A sketch found later showed Ayad had made a rough drawing of the floor plan. Then, just four days before the bombing, at Yosef's request, Iyad Ishmael arrived in New York from Dallas to help complete the bomb making. Ishmael would also drive the vehicle carrying the bomb into the garage. He was Yosef's trusted friend, and he had been a New York City cab driver. Perfect credentials for this delicate operation. On February 23rd, Salome went to DIB leasing and rented a 10-foot Ford Econoline panel van. He left a cash deposit of $400. Construction of the bomb was nearly complete. There was one more reconnaissance visit to the World Trade Center garage. In a burgundy Chevy Corsica rented by Ayala, with Salome listed as the second driver. The conspirators returned to the garage with Yosef and Ishmael to determine the precise location for placing the bomb. Jurors were shown another garage claim ticket that confirmed the time of the visit, the make of the car, and the garage level they parked on, the B2 level. Meanwhile, Ayad had managed to reach a firm that would sell him compressed hydrogen. He ordered three large tanks, which were delivered to the space station storage the next day. On February 25th at the Pamrapo apartment, Abu Halima and the others carefully mixed sulfuric and nitric acid with glycerin into the deadly and volatile substance nitroglycerin. They mixed an estimated 1,200 pounds of urea crystals with several gallons of nitric acid. They poured it into big metal drums where it formed a gel-like mass. They transferred the urea nitrate mass into plastic trash cans. The others had backed the van down the driveway behind the house and up to the apartment door. They packed the cargo hold with their creation, a lethal cocktail of chemicals, bonding agent, fuse, and detonator. They loaded the trash cans and then arranged the home-brewed nitroglycerin among them. They had threaded four long fuses through surgical tubing to reduce the smoke and slow the burn enough for the bombers to escape. The fuses were rigged to blasting caps and boxes of gunpowder, 
and then insert it into each of the nitro containers. All that was missing was the hydrogen, which was used to make the blast even more devastating. In the Ryder van, followed by Ayad's Corsica, they drove to the space station to pick up the hydrogen. They loaded it carefully in the van, propping the three red tanks behind the boxes of nitro against the rear doors. Joseph and Ishmoel drove the van from New Jersey to a hotel in Manhattan. Hotel records show that Ishmoel had reserved a room for the night on February 25th. They parked it out back for the night, hidden from view. At 10 that evening, from his home in Jersey City, Salome informed New Jersey police that the van had been stolen. He spun a story about parking it at a grocery store and coming out to find it gone. Later that night, he met with police to document the loss. He knew he would need a valid police report if he was going to get his deposit back. Agents learned that Salome had purchased a child's airline ticket abroad because it was all he could afford. He needed the van deposit back so he could upgrade the ticket to an adult fare. With the vehicle having been reported stolen, everything was in place. The bombers took their last drive to the World Trade Center. At about two minutes past noon the next day, Friday, February 26, 1993, the bomber's rider van pulled into the B-2 level ramp of the World Trade Center. The Burgundy Corsica followed. Ishmoel drove the van as Yosef sat in the passenger seat. the van into a space normally occupied by a New York Port Authority van. Since Port Authority owns the World Trade Center, their vehicles have easy access in and out of the garage. The getaway car waited nearby. One of the men held a cigarette lighter against the fuse. As it began to burn, they rushed to the Corsica and pulled away. The flames raced along, an inch every two and a half seconds, silent and almost smoke-free because of the surgical tubing. The gunpowder was packed into Atlas Rockmaster blasting caps, the kind used in the demolition of large building sites. Four fuses were used to guarantee the bomb would detonate. Yosef, Ishmael, and the others exited the garage a few seconds before the blast. At 12.18 p.m., the months of planning this destruction was about to become a reality. The explosion hit the wall of the tower with a massive force, destroying everything around it. Later that day, as rescue workers and investigators were still responding to the scene, Yosef sat safely aboard an airplane to Pakistan and Ishmoel aboard a plane to Jordan. Within days, Abu Halima had also fled. If investigators had not found and tracked the VIN number so quickly, Salome would likely have escaped too. Over the course of the six-month trial, the jury heard from 206 witnesses and reviewed a total of 10,000 pages of testimony. In February of 1994, a year after the bombing, the trial concluded. 
It took the jury just three days to reach a verdict. The jury forewoman read off 38 pronouncements of guilty. Conspiracy, explosive destruction of property, interstate transportation of explosives, and murder. When she finished, the courtroom erupted. Ayad and Salome leapt up, screaming the verdict was an injustice. Only Abu Halima had remained silent. He sat calmly, arms folded, with a bemused smile on his face. Three months after their convictions, on May 24, 1994, Judge Kevin Duffy sentenced each bomber to a year in prison for each year of life he had deprived the victims. It came to 240 years apiece, with no possibility of parole. Sentencing went on for hours, with each defendant making a lengthy speech. Muhammad Salome, the chemist Nidal Ayad, Ahmed Ajaj, the man who brought the bomb manuals into the country, and Mahmoud Abu Halima, known as the Red, will spend the rest of their lives in prison. Though the trial of the four defendants was a success, the mastermind Ramzi Yosef and his accomplice Iyad Ishmael were still fugitives. Four of the six conspirators in the World Trade Center bombing had been convicted. But the FBI still sought the mastermind of the bombing as the search for Ramzi Yosef and his accomplice Iyad Ishmael continued. Agents learned that Yosef was involved in several terrorist plots designed to bring down commercial airliners worldwide. Advisories were issued to American travelers abroad. More terrorist attacks on Americans or American interests were likely following the verdict. Yosef was one of the most dangerous and elusive men in the world. But subsequent to the World Trade Center incident, it's obvious and apparent that he was planning additional acts of terrorism around the world. Uh, the air conspiracy case uh, certainly sh re reveals that uh, the extent of what was being planned, uh, the, uh, the fact that he was moving around throughout the world, the country, several countries, indicates a wide range of support that he and his compatriots had. It was not until February of 1995, two years after the Trade Center bomb went off, that Ramzi Yosef was apprehended in Pakistan and turned over to FBI agents. Agent Stern was sent to retrieve Yosef and bring him back. Yosef was suddenly willing to talk. His hatred for the United States and its aid to Israel was all-consuming. He told Stern that the World Trade Center was chosen as his target because it was the greatest symbol of American finance and imperialism. He felt that it was kind of like a state of war. He compared it to the United States' um, atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, you know, where he said a quarter of a million people were, were killed. And he felt that uh, if he could topple one of the towers into the other, uh, he, he would kill that many people. And it was a similar type act. The final arrest came six months later, in June of 1995. Iyad Ishmael was discovered and apprehended in Jordan. He too was returned to the United States to stand trial for his role in the bombing. Yosef and Ishmael were tried together in New York City. In January of 1998, after being found guilty of the same 38 charges that the other defendants had faced, a judge sentenced the two to life in prison with no possibility of parole. The judge, calling Yosef an apostle of evil, ruled that Yosef should serve the remainder of his life in solitary confinement. Only a life of solitude could prevent Yosef from conspiring to kill again. With the major conspirators imprisoned for life, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies have had a chance to reflect on the magnitude of this investigation. Well, the World Trade Center case really 
in many ways was a, a real wake-up call for uh, law enforcement. It was the largest single act of international terrorism in the country. And um, although terrorism has been here for many years, uh, certainly on the scope that we saw the World Trade Center was something that was uh, unique and uh, certainly much more horrific than we've seen in the past. The bombers did $550 million worth of destruction to the World Trade Center. The financial damage caused by the disruption of national and international business was also deeply felt. America had been jolted from its belief that international terrorist attacks don't happen on American soil. By bringing such a complex and far-reaching conspiracy to a close so quickly, the FBI sent a message around the world. The taking of innocent lives will never be tolerated.